Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked on Wolves. Today on the show, we're going to break down the Wolves Suns first round series by the numbers, what to look out for, what each of these teams did overall in the regular season, and a little bit from their head to head matchup that could give us some cause for optimism heading into the first round, and also some stats that maybe aren't as positive. We'll break the whole thing down. Welcome in. You are Locked on Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go. The mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. Happy Tuesday, everybody. We are inching closer to Wolves Suns starting on Saturday. Lots to get to today. I'm going to set up the week for you here in a moment as well. Lots of exciting shows coming up. uh, And so I'll tell you a little bit about that. Today, specifically, I want to look at this matchup by the numbers and more broadly what each of these teams did this season overall in the regular season, what they've done more recently and also what they've done head to head, what stood out to me when I dug into this. And uh, like I said, I'll set up all the rest of the shows the rest of the week here in a moment as well. First of all, though, a big thank you for making lockdown wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms, wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find lockdown wolves. You can also watch on the lockdown sports, Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T-Wolves, and also at B-Beacon with two Bs, two Es, C-K-E-N. All right, uh, so like I said, for the week, real quick, want to set this up. So today, the show is by the numbers. I'm going to go into um, a handful of, of, of big picture type things. What stands out to me about this matchup? Tomorrow, Wednesday's show, it'll be a bit more of a film study show. I'm, I'm going back and watching. I'm in the midst of rewatching. I know none of them, none of them are good games. None of them are fun to watch, but important to watch the, the three regular season matchups between these two teams, obviously in much different places, right? The first one was the schedule loss. Second night of a back-to-back way back in mid-November. The second one was a catless uh, loss to the Suns. And then this last one was, um, I mean, I guess the one that's most relevant, right? Uh, with both rosters mostly intact, although it's cat second game back. Um, so anyway, lots of, you know, caveats to all these, but how were the Wolves defending Kevin Durant, how are they defending Devin Booker? To a lesser extent, how are they defending Bradley Beal in each of these games? And and on the flip side, how are the Suns handling Anthony Edwards? And and I want to talk more about that. We'll actually get into that a little bit today. Um, but what stood what stands out to me from a film review of the of those three regular season games, especially in terms of matchups and how teams were defending the opposing team's best players. And also Rudy Gobert, his performance has not been great against Phoenix and what was a really good overall season for Gobert. So we'll talk about that too. Uh, that's Wednesday show. Then on Thursday, we'll have a special crossover edition of Lockdown Wolves along with Brent, Brendan Clean of Lockdown Suns, who does a fantastic job covering the Suns over there. And we're going to ask each other some questions about the matchup, about the opposing team. Um, and we'll also give some predictions. So that'll be Thursday show. And then Friday, I'll do my total, my overall predictions for the series. Obviously, my final prediction for the results of the series and some more shorter term predictions for uh, Saturday's game one as well. So a packed week ahead, really looking forward to all of them, but especially Thursday with Brendan, that's going to be a ton of fun today though. Let's dive into this matchup by the numbers. So what I did is I went to cleaning the glass. I looked at all, I looked at the four factors. I looked at, um, which of course are, are effective field goal shooting. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's rebounding on both ends of the floor. It's turnover rate. It's free throw rate on both ends of the floor. And I looked at, I, I took it a layer deeper. I went on cleaning the glass and I looked at um, essentially each team's shot selection on offense and what they force opponents to do defensively in terms of their shot. And one of, in terms of the shots they allow opponents to get. I said from the start of the season, way back in probably October or into November, I was talking about actually, yeah, before the season, like as part of a season preview, my, concern the teams that concern me the most in the West, the Suns were number one. And it wasn't just because they have Kevin Durant. It was 
because of the types of shots that the Phoenix Suns like to get. And the Wolves struggle with them last year, and obviously the Suns look different with Beal and no Chris Paul, but the Suns are always a concern of mine because they love to shoot mid-range jumpers. They have guys who are historically good at making long twos, and the Wolves' defense is constructed to allow opponents to shoot mid-range twos. You have to let your opponent shoot something, right? You can't block every shot. You can't turn them over on every possession. So there has to be a hole somewhere. And so the idea is you funnel those shots to the, the, the parts of the floor where it's least efficient or most difficult and or most difficult to make a shot from. So if I could just like boil this series down to one phrase, and this is grossly oversimplified it, it it's concern over the sun's mid range prowess and the wolves, a uh, uh, general indifference and, and actually encouragement of opponents to shoot mid range jumpers. Now, there's obviously going to be adjustments for both sides, right? Because Minnesota will have to adjust the game plan to some extent because Kevin Durant shooting 60% on mid-range jumpers is a lot different than D'Angelo Russell shooting 44% on mid-range jumpers, right? Like those are different things. Still, that is a concerning factor in this series. Now, taking a half step backwards here, looking at the four factors, what stood out to me there is... Well, we talk about, we bring our hands about Minnesota's turnover problems, and, and rightfully so, right? Minnesota was was 23rd this year in turnover rate. They improved incrementally as the season wore on. Now, honestly, part of that was Carl Anthony Towns. Like, the Wolves were better with Cat off the floor. with He was hurt in terms of turnovers. Cat's turnover prone. The ball was going through him a lot. It actually moved more when he was on the floor in general, or, uh, yeah, when he was healthy. Um, there wasn't any more move, ball movement without him. There were less turnovers. Uh, it was effectively the same. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. The, the actual number of passes per game was basically the same without cap, but the turnovers went down, right? They, they were just trying. They were not trying to do too much in the same way that they did when cat was on the floor pre-injury. However, Phoenix actually turns it over more frequently than Minnesota. And this is for the season. I know that things have trended a little bit differently recently, but I don't always know that that's like, it's easy to say, Oh, since March 1st, Phoenix, blah, blah, blah. But like, can we completely discount the rest of the season? Now, I, I obviously the more recent stuff, I think I think we can weight that greater, right? What happened in March is more relevant than what happened in November. I don't think there's any question about that. But I want to be careful with taking anything, uh, you know, taking anything to the bank that doesn't at least include the the um, the context of the 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 broader context, I guess, right? Like the, the season as a whole. So for the season, Phoenix actually had a higher turnover rate offensively than Minnesota. Phoenix was 14.9%, 25th in the league, according to Clean the Glass Souls were 14.5%. On the flip side of the ball, Minnesota's defense forced turnovers at a much higher rate than Phoenix. And this was something the Wolves improved at over the course of the season too. Early in the year, the Wolves were not forcing a whole lot of turnovers. By the end of the year, the Wolves are actually fifth in the league in opponent turnover rate. They were forcing teams to turn the ball over 14 and a half percent of the time uh, uh, defensively for Minnesota and Phoenix did not turn opponents over at a very high clip. Now, as I'm going to do with each of these four factors that I pulled out, this didn't have a major role in the season series. As we saw on Sunday, when the Wolves turned the ball over like it was nobody's business, they turned it over 24 times and 11 times in the first quarter alone, which allowed Phoenix to build that 22 point lead that they you know never got closer than nine right after the first quarter. So Minnesota was a minus 11 on Sunday playing against Phoenix. The game prior, they were a minus one in the total turnover category. And the first game earlier this year, back in November, was such a high scoring back and forth affair. There were only 15 total turnovers and the Wolves actually only turned it over six times in that game. But uh, they just, it was a layup line for Phoenix. So while I make this, you know, you look at the four factors like, ah, oh, the Wolves turn it over a little bit, a little bit, slightly less than Phoenix. And they force opponent turnovers at a at a you know percent half higher rate than Phoenix. However, the season series, the three game sample of the two teams against each other, the Wolves actually turned it over 15 more times than Phoenix. Which you know this is gonna this is gonna be a very clear like this is an example. Yes, the three games head to head matter, but it's still just three games. Now, of course, you only need to win four in the first round series to advance. But let's be careful here, right? Because for the season, Phoenix turned it over more frequently and forced less turnovers defensively. So the Wolves, that's a category they should have a shot to win. Now, it's not simply small sample alert because of the three games. The matchup also matters too, right? And that's part of my concern here is I don't like the Phoenix matchup for Minnesota. 
And that could be part of the issue here. It could be how Phoenix plays Minnesota versus other teams. Like that stuff all matters, which again is why there's grains of salt to be needed here or that, that are needed here when we talk about full season data. But when you look at that, Minnesota shouldn't have a disadvantage when it comes to forcing and committing turnovers. Uh, two other four factors I want to look at, and then I want to look at a couple things that stand out about when the Wolves are on offense and also the Wolves are on defense. And this will bleed right into tomorrow's conversation related to the film study because the numbers and the film, they're going to match up to some extent, right? There's going to be some things that the numbers say one thing and then you watch the film and it looks, it feels a little bit different and vice versa. And there's some things that are going to mesh completely. And I want to talk through all that on Wednesday's show. But again, setting that up here today by what some of these numbers tell us. And so a couple more four factors to get to, and then we'll talk Wolves offense. We'll talk Wolves on defense. We'll do all that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at BetterHelp. The show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. So today I want to say how I really feel about something. You may be thinking about the same thing this week. I bet you probably are. And it's, I don't like the vibes of the Wolves heading into the playoffs and the vibes of the fan base. And this is, I, I get dangerous territory to like vent about this in this way, but here we are. Um, like the vibes aren't good, right? For the Wolves. But the sky is not falling. The Timberwolves still had a fantastic regular season, one of the best two regular seasons in, in franchise history. And they were really unlucky with their first round draw, but they're still really good. They're still the uh, the league's best defense with a bullet. They still have, you know, uh, one of the best coaching jobs all season, one of the most improved players in Ant, one of the uh, bounce back type players in Rudy, six man candidate in Nas Reed, multiple all stars, like probably multiple NBA guys. This uh, uh, probably just one all NBA guy in Ant. But there's a lot to be happy about going into the playoffs. And regardless of the matchup, this is going to be a competitive series. That's as far as I'm willing to go in terms of a prediction at this point. It will absolutely be competitive. This will not be a sweep. It will not be a gentleman's sweep. This is going to be a fun series. And look, I recognize I might be a little bit extra fired up about this. Uh, like, you know, if you're listening to the show, you might be too. But hey, many people have bigger problems than our favorite sports team, you know, and, and what the outlook is going to the playoffs. Therapy does look different for everyone. And I mean, it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on NBA. It's Locked On's NFL Mock Draft live on April 17th. That is tomorrow, Wednesday, at 6 Central, 7 Eastern, streaming on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Find the ultimate six-episode series on April 17th at 6 Central, 7 Eastern to hear who the local Locked On experts are picking for every NFL franchise. With live reactions from local college football experts and even the fantasy football angle, the Lockdown NFL Mock Draft tomorrow, Wednesday, April 17th on 6 Central, 7 Eastern, streaming live on Lockdown Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. All right. A couple more four factors to get to. So first of all, the Wolves should have an edge in the turnover battle. They did not in the regular season series. Take that for what it's worth. Second thing is, I worry a little bit about the Wolves' ability to keep Phoenix off the glass. Phoenix was a top 10 offensive rebounding team this year, 28.2% offensive rebound rate. Uh, this is according to cleaning the glass, meaning uh, nearly one in every three potential offensive rebounds was corralled by Phoenix. And the Timberwolves, defensive rebound-wise, were much improved this year, far better than they were last year and certainly the year before. And of course, Rudy Gobert is a massive part of that. Um, I like basketball reference, they're eighth in defensive rebound, right? Cleaning the glass, which I like a little bit more. They were 10th. So top 10 either way. But the Wolves don't have the same advantage on the offensive glass on their end. Minnesota's offensive rebound rate plummeted this year. They were bottom 10 in offensive rebound rate. And Phoenix is still a good defensive rebounding team. They're, they're around league average. However, I worry about, and, and like, again, it, in the same way as the turnover stuff, where you would expect Phoenix to have a little bit of an advantage, they did not have a significant advantage in the three 
game regular season series. In fact, the Wolves are actually a plus 11 in offensive rebounding in the regular season series. Now, that all came. They were plus, I think, minus one in this last game, plus one in the game before that. The first game of the year when Phoenix won by 18, the Wolves are actually a plus 11 in offensive rebounding. So take that with a massive grain of salt. That was just a function of the Wolves missing a ton of shots and getting their own opportunities up. And it wasn't a close game at any point because the Wolves were so bad defensively in that November 15th uh, showdown with the Suns. Call it a showdown. It was a blood. Um, but I worry about Yusuf Nurkic. He gives Rudy Gobert all kinds of trouble. I worry about him in this matchup. I worry about um, you know some other role players that Phoenix has, guys that can be more active on the glass. The Wolves don't have a ton of those guys. They don't have a ton of those do stuff guys that are that are genuinely active on the glass all the time. Um, and you know that that it worries me it, that just that part of this matchup concerns me a little bit. Um, and 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 you saw this by the way, even though. Like I said, it was only a, like a what a, a one um, a one rebound. I think the Wolves were a minus one in the offensive glass on Sunday in Game 82 against Phoenix. But over the course of a series, it worries me. And we also saw at key moments in the third and fourth quarter of Sunday's matchup, that's when the Suns, you know, it really mattered, and the Wolves could not get a defensive rebound to save their lives. And uh, you know, Phoenix again, top ten in offensive rebounding. I mentioned Nurkic being the primary concern. Um, you know, he's not, he's not the only one like Thaddeus young only played in 10 regular season games for this team. He's probably going to be in this playoff rotation. He's active on the glass for his position. Um, like there's other role, like bull bulls, another one, like you worry about what he could be able to contribute. He was big in the game the other day. So, um, I have concern there. Okay. That's the second one. The third spot would be the free throw line. Both teams get to the line a bunch. The Phoenix Suns were number one in offensive free throw rate this year. They got they averaged 22 free throw attempts uh, per 100 possessions, which is massive. The Timberwolves were number eight, which is only 0.9 behind them. And I think I, I looked at it. I think it was like, what, 36 or 46 total less free throw attempts this season the Wolves had, which is, you know, call it half a free throw a game, roughly. That adds up. So over the course, you know, assuming you're shooting those free throws at 80 plus percent, that's two or three points over the course of a same seven game series, maybe four points that may end up really mattering if that rate continues into the playoffs. But the reason why I'm most worried about it is on the other end of the floor. Phoenix is only seven or they are seventh in defensive free throw rate, according to cleaning the glass, meaning they don't foul opponents or allow free throws at least very often, whereas Minnesota was was. Dead center, middle of the pack. 15th on cleaning the glass, 21st on basketball reference in terms of free throw rate. So, the and that they got worse throughout the year. Remember, we talked in like January, February about how the Wolves were top 10 in all four factors defensively. They really struggled. Uh, and this was, I did a whole show on this a couple of weeks ago, post-cat injury, post-Gobert money symbol uh, to the referees uh, in that tactical of the game in Cleveland. Post all that stuff. The Wolves free throw rate has gone in the exact opposite direction on the defensive end of the floor. And Phoenix gets the line more than anybody else. This is one of my primary concerns of this series is, and we saw it on Sunday. I know the Wolves ended up shooting more free throws, but that was the Wolves getting the Suns in the bone in the penalty and fighting back into the game a little bit, sort of, you know, to get into that nine, 12, 14 point deficit range. But early in the game, as the Suns built their lead, it was the offensive fouls, right? Carl Thay Towns commits three offensive fouls, which are, of course, three turnovers, puts him on the bench early with foul trouble. Um, some of the other stuff Kevin Durant is able to do with his combination of length, physicality, despite how slight he is in terms of build, he's physical, and also skill, obviously. A and also the fact that he's a wily veteran who can draw fouls. And Durant does it, Devin Booker to a lesser extent, but was really good at it on Sunday, and also Bradley Beal. Uh, and Nurkic matches and can exceed the physicality of the Wolves front court. So I worry about the Wolves not being able to keep pace in terms of free throws. And hopefully it would be in the Wolves benefit if the playoffs are officiated, like how we'd expect the playoffs to be officiated, which is, you know, not the Dwayne Wade finals of 15 years ago or whatever, but less foul calls, more physical play, the officials letting the players play. And, you know, the Suns have already, I think it was Bradley Beal said it publicly. Like we always say, just foul Ant, like foul him, foul him. Like they, he literally said foul Anthony Edwards for a couple of reasons. One, they would rather do that and live with 
you know, are they going to call the foul or not? I mean, that's the main reason, right? Because if they don't call the foul, he's probably not going to make the shot. And Ant's going to complain and probably get back, not get back defensively. That's probably part of it, right? The second piece of it is they know that the officials are not going to call fouls and Anthony Edwards goes to the basket at the same frequency because it's the Shaq factor. We talked about this a month ago, six weeks ago, around the same time as the Rudy Gobert money sign thing. Because Ant is so strong and physically imposing, guys bounce off of him. It's the SGA fouling Ant on the arm and it being called marginal contact. It's it's that, right? It doesn't look like much because Anthony Edwards is so physically imposing. And then obviously the Suns are really good at what they do. And all those, I'm not like all those things play together to allow the Suns to have such an impressive free throw rate. And and defensively, where they don't foul opponents, they're they're seventh in the league in defensive free throw rate, as in they only allow, you know, less than 18 free throw attempts per hundred possessions for opponents. That's a skill to defend without fouling. And the Wolves were very good at it early in the season, surprisingly so, and very bad at it late in the season. It worked itself out to a middle of the pack, number 15 ranking in terms of defensive free throw rate. So that'll be something to keep an eye on. So summarizing the four factors piece, I worry about turnovers. Although for this season, Phoenix turns it over a little bit more than Minnesota and the Wolves should have the advantage in that category. Wasn't the case the regular season series. Offensive rebounding, Phoenix is a better offensive rebounding, a better overall rebounding team than Minnesota. And while the Wolves had a slight regular season advantage, that doesn't mean a whole lot to me. I worry about that, Nurkic and others uh, uh, in this series. And then also free throw shooting. Phoenix is the best in the league at getting to the line. They're very good at not fouling. The Wolves get to the line a fair amount, but they foul too much, especially recently, and especially against a team like the Suns that draws fouls so well. That's a concern of mine as well. All right, let's close by talking about, let's do one thing on offense, one thing on defense. That will lead us into Wednesday's show and a, a bit of a film breakdown on Wednesday. That's all upcoming here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends over at Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard's not looking good. We were just there on Sunday, Wolves Sons. You're feeling low. You're not sure you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep, lift your head up, and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. Play in countless dynamic Monopoly boards. Make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. Charge other players rent for your iconic properties and more. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go. Now, free on the App Store or Google Play. All right. A couple things here to close. We've talked about how Phoenix loves to shoot mid-range jumpers, and the Wolves give up mid-range jumpers. We'll talk a little more about that here in a second. On the flip side of the ball, when the Wolves are on offense, a massive key to this series that we're going to have to keep an eye on is corner three-point shooting. Phoenix allows a lot of corner three-point attempts. They were 17th in the league defensively in terms of allowing corner three-point shots, meaning they allow a fair amount of them. They also a lot were 17th in allowing three point shots, period. And part of this, at least against the Wolves, is going to be how they defend Anthony Edwards. More on that in a second. On the Wolves, for the Wolves, Minnesota finished the regular season eighth in corner three point attempt frequency in the league. And they finished number five in corner three point attempt. Accuracy. So nearly 11% of the Wolves three point, excuse me, 11% of the Wolves field goal attempts came from the corners came were three point corner, three point attempts, but they were number five in three point percentage from the corners, 41.3%. Okay. Those are really encouraging numbers, especially when you look at a Phoenix team that allowed a ton of corner threes. And on the flip side, like a, a pro for Phoenix and negative for Minnesota is Phoenix actually allowed the lowest percentage from the corners. Now, what that tells me 
is first of all, that's a that's a bit of a hole in their defensive scheme. Now, obviously, that changes depending on the opponent. But number two, Phoenix got pretty lucky. Well, I talk about how opponent three point shooting isn't all luck, and I said it very early in the season when I got tired of people saying the Wolves are getting lucky, opponents are missing threes. There's a science to contesting three point shots. Schemes matter, xing out matters, like all that stuff matters. And I'm going to dig into this a little bit more in the film study. There could be something there that I'm missing that Phoenix does really well, and and I'll report back if that's the case. But a team shooting just a team whose opponent shot just 36% from the corners when league average is like, I don't know, what is it like 39% from the corners, I believe. Um, actually, hang on. I think I have it right here. I ah, know I lost it. Oh, well. Um, actually, you know what? I think I could pull it up quick. I think it's like 39% from the corners. All that to say, there is some good fortune there for Phoenix. Here it is. I have it right here. I'm just going to pull it up. League average from the corners, I was right, 39.1%. And opponents shot just 36% from the corners against Phoenix. There's some good fortune there. But they allow those shots. Nearly 10% of opponent shots came from the corners. 17th in the league for Phoenix's defense. That means those corner threes will be there for Minnesota. And Minnesota is a good corner three-point shooting team. There were a couple of plays I can think of specifically on Sunday. There was one, I think it was a, I can't remember if it was Cat or Ant, I think it was Cat skipped a pass to the opposite corner. Alexander Walker had an open three and missed it. There was another play. Jane McDaniels had a wide open corner three and he missed it. The Suns are going to live with Jane McDaniels shooting corner threes. They are. He's got to make them. And we've seen him go through stretches this year where he's been really good. He was better last year than he was this year shooting catch and shoot threes. The Wolves have to make corner three point shots in this series if they're going to take advantage of of Phoenix's scheme. And this will, this bleeds into what we certainly will talk about Wednesday. And I'm sure on Thursday as well, the way that Phoenix defends Anthony Edwards, the way I described it on Monday show was they essentially play him with one and two half guys, almost like a zone, right? Like a mini zone. They have a primary defender and they have two guys that are half guarding him and half guarding someone else. They're effectively guarding the gaps. It's, it's early gap help. It's not even gap help. They're just, it's like they're building a wall, but it's a triangle right? There's a primary defender and there's two guys behind them. Ant has to A, make quicker decisions, which we talked about on Monday show, and B, make, not just make the right decision, but make a good pass or make a, like, make the shots he's given. But the biggest thing is those quick decisions, flipping the floor, right? Getting the ball to the other side of the floor. It could be, you know, driving in and skipping it to the opposite corner, depending on how the Suns are playing that and how they're defending, you know, Rudy, assuming Rudy's down near the uh, down near the basket because there could be a defender sagging off of Rudy ready to play free safety, pick that pass off. It's how the Wolves defended other teams this year. Um, and, and that's something the Wolves will need to pay attention to is, is if they continue to guard Ant in that way, can you get the ball to the corners and can you make those threes? Which, by the way, side note, Carl Anthony Towns playing out of the corners. I know that that's been a running joke, like Cat doesn't want to do it. But stick Cat in a corner, and he's going to shoot. Like, he made that corner three that actually his foot was on the line. It was a two as the Wolves were trying to make that comeback. I think it got them to down nine or down ten in the third quarter. Cat's good from those corners, and that could be a way to use him and also minimize his playmaking opportunities until he feels a little more comfortable, right? He's not playing well with the ball in his hands. Put him in the corner. That's a lot more dangerous than Jaden McDaniels in the corner. Just a thought. Uh, but expect those threes to be open and the Wolves have to absolutely take advantage of them. The second thing quickly, when the Wolves are on defense, Phoenix doesn't get to the rim a whole lot. They were 25th in terms of shots at the rim, according to cleaning the glass, just a little over 30% of their shot attempts this year came from the rim, came from at the rim. And the Wolves deter teams from getting to the rim. They were actually, the Wolves are actually just ninth in terms of defense, defensive, uh, rim rate, like allowing opponents to shoot at the rim. But when Gobert is on the floor, that number plummets by 5%. Is that what it was? Uh, 5.5%. So opponents shoot 5.5% less shots at the rim when Gobert is on the floor. But that's also why Gobert is less effective in a Phoenix matchup because the Suns don't care about getting to the rim. The Suns are happy to shoot long twos. They're happy to shoot mid-range twos. And therein lies the biggest problem with this matchup where we started the show. Phoenix is more than happy to have a historically good mid-range shooter in Kevin Durant and a uh, you know one of the best of this of this generation, I guess. Generation's an aggressive word. The best of the last five years in mid-range in Devin Booker and then add in Bradley Beal. 
who's comfortable shooting from anywhere. Um, and that plays right into the sun's hands, what the wolves allow. And it somewhat mitigates Gobert's effect. Now that said over the course of the game, there's still going to be rim attempts and Rudy Gobert is valuable in those attempts. We'll talk more about Rudy as the week goes on, but that's something to keep an eye on. The wolves limit rim attempts. Phoenix doesn't care about getting to the rim that much. They're happy to shoot in the mid range and it mitigates Gobert's effectiveness. It's, one of the reasons this matchup isn't ideal for Minnesota. All right. I meant to close with a more optimistic note. I didn't. I'm sorry. There are reasons for optimism in this matchup. There are. And I, I mentioned a couple, right? The turnover stuff that, you know, Sunday I felt like the worst thing ever with how many, and it was with how many turnovers the Wolves had. But he, that was so uncharacteristic. And the sun shot the light out. And, you know, it so shut the lights out. And in this matchup, I can't imagine the Wolves turning it over anywhere near the rate that they've done it against the Suns so far this season. So, like, there's silver linings here in this matchup. And I promise, I already said it once, this is not, like, I'm not predicting the series yet. I'm going to finish the film study. I'm going to finish all this stuff the next couple of days. It's not going to be a sweep. It's not going to be a gentleman's sweep. The Wolves are not losing this series in, in four or five. That's not happening. I'll give a final prediction later in the week. Wednesday show, we'll get a little bit more into defense, how the Wolves defended Durant, Booker, Beal in the regular season and how the Suns defended primarily Anthony Edwards in the season series as well. So we'll get to all that on Wednesday. Again, Thursday, crossover episode with crossover episode with Brendan Clean from Lockdown Suns. That'll be Thursday, and then a big preview show on Friday as well. That's all we got for you today here on the show. A big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T-Wolves and also at B-Beacon with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. The Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.